Meet one of my participants, a vampire player who enacted his primary character for four years. A council of elders dragged him before them, humiliated him, discussed how they would punish him through torture or death, and finally murdered him. While this sort of content is commonplace in vampiric politics, the participant called the scene traumatic, stating, to be honest, I frankly wasn't really ready for that moment at that age, that life experience and as a role player. It did affect me quite severely emotionally. He described feeling shocked and being unable to sleep that night as the scene replayed in his dreams. He felt a lingering depression for months after the incident. Because of the death of his character, he lost many in-game relationships with other players, resulting in feelings of grief and isolation. As a scholar and a participant in various role-playing communities for almost 20 years, I've always been fascinated with the relationship between the character and the player. Although we often emphasize the distinction between the character and the self, in all my interviews and informal discussions with role players over the years, one thing has become clear. People role play in order to feel things. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the emotions that role playing, role playing can produce and give some examples of how players in games have dealt with these emotions in productive and not so productive ways. Players enjoy role playing for different reasons. Some people like the intellectual challenge of deciphering an overarching plot or manipulating complex mechanics. The style of play can produce extreme feelings of what Nicole Lazaro calls fiero, the tension between the frustration of failure and the exhilaration of success. For other players, the act of participating itself provides the pleasure, the ability to step outside of oneself and become a central component of a shared story. Finally, for many people, the pleasure of role-playing is cathartic, allowing players to experience deep emotions through the character in a safe setting. Regardless of the style of play, many role-players speak of their golden moments. Those experiences where the game seems to crystallize into one distinct pinnacle. While some of these golden moments are exhilarating in nature, I've often heard tales of torture, humiliation, grief, wrath, and defeat even from players engaged in games from the so-called heroic genres like Dungeons and & Dragons and fantasy boffer-larps. When I reflect upon all the golden moments I've heard described casually or as part of my research, I'm surprised at how many of them feature what most of us would consider undesirable states. This phenomenon is intriguing, as Marcus Montel has explored in his scholarly work. Most of the time, players process these intense experiences into positive memories. Yet sometimes, undesirable states linger long after the game, imposing psychological distress upon the player and negatively impacting the community at large. The vampire a player I mentioned earlier experienced a negative impact caused by intense emotions related to the game. His experience went unresolved for a long period of time. These emotions often emerge from enacting a character long term, identifying with that persona, growing attached to the relationships established in game and losing the character. While role players often like to think the boundary between the game and mundane reality is rock solid, examples like this are a more common phenomenon than many would like to admit. I recently conducted scholarly research on the causes of conflict that erupt within role playing communities. I conducted interviews with 20 participants from the United States and 10 from Europe including eight who considered themselves part of the Nordic LARP community. These interviews explored the various causes for disruption in gro group cohesion, including the phenomenon of bleed. A term coined by Emily Kerr Boss, bleed is the blurring of the emotions, thoughts, physical state, and relationship dynamics of the player and the character. These aspects sometimes bleed in from the player, affecting the character's in-game experiences, or bleed out, when the game events influence our daily lives. Feelings of romantic love, animosity, friendship, and grief can sometimes switch from one frame of reference to the other, causing confusion for role players. Bleed disrupts the normally detached perspectives that players maintain during games. In fact, many role players are uncomfortable admit admitting that bleed exists. Some react with extreme negativity if you suggest that their characters connect with their real-life personas in any way, or if you insinuate that game events might actually affect them as people. 
This dismissive attitude is common in many American LARP communities, in part because over the years role players have faced stigma from both the mainstream and our own subcultures. The societal fear that role players will become out of touch with reality or lose themselves in the game has elevated to the level of hysteria at times in the history of the practice. While such ac accusations are alarmist in nature, you may have met someone who took the game too seriously or even been accused of such a crime yourself. For example, I interviewed a, formal, uh, a former national storyteller for the Mind's Eye Society, the global LARP organization specializing in white wolf games, such as Vampire. He told me, when someone loses their character, when someone loses their character, I think they're entitled to a couple days of being sad about it, as long as they're not destructive or belligerent. But if, after a week, you're still feeling sad about it, then I think that person is taking things way too seriously. Organizers from other American communities express even less tolerance for negative bleed emotions. I recently heard an organizer publicly insist that players should simply walk it off when they are upset after a game. We can understand these reactions if we keep in mind the concept of alibi. As part of the social contract of role-playing games, <laughs> players enter the world with the understanding that nothing that will occur is real, and that any action that their characters take does not originate from themselves. This alibi allows us to minimize any actions that occur in a reductive fashion, with dismissive phrases like, it's just a game and it's what my character would have done. This alibi is both true and, paradoxically, a convenient fiction. While the events of the game world are indeed fictional, in the sense that they do not happen in the mundane world, uh, the player vicariously experiences these events through identification with the character. Long-term immersion into a character or a campaign may intensify this identification. Bleed also tends to increase when stories feature high-level stakes and when the players create and develop their own characters. Unlike many American role players, members of the Nordic LARP community and other experimental groups have placed strong emotional reactions at the forefront of game design, advocating concepts such as playing to lose or playing for bleed. The Nordic LARP community, which has popularized this notion of bleed, takes the fiction of the alibi as a given and strives towards bleed rather than viewing it as an unfortunate side effect. This sort of intense play requires extensive safety considerations to ensure that players feel comfortable exploring these emotions. Consider the following story from one of my Nordic LARP participants who played in a one-shot immersive Nordic game. During months of pre-game preparation, he became close to another person who planned to play the role of his best friend. At the LARP, the participant discovered a dark secret. This best friend character had a sexual relationship with his character's father. He shared with me, I felt deeply hurt and betrayed. I actually punched my father for real, leaving a bruise that lasted for weeks after the game. It took several months for me to get rid of the feelings of betrayal and antipathy towards these two persons. This example illustrates how even in the Nordic LARP community, which values extreme emotional experiences in games, long-term distress can result from these moments if not handled delicately. In order to provide greater safety, Nordic LARP groups have emphasized transparency in game design, which allows players to select whether an emotionally intense game is right for them. Nordic LARP games also often feature workshoppings before the game, emotional signaling systems within the game, and extensive debriefing after the game in order to give players a chance to check in with one another emotionally. Debriefing in particular allows the players the opportunity to share lingering feelings of anger or pain, which helps to resolve disputes and diffuse negative bleed. In both the Vampire and the Nordic LARP examples, the players did not engage in immediate debriefing after the game, which might have helped both the individuals and the community process their role-playing experiences as positive. Debriefing sometimes occurs informally in groups. My final example arises from a participant in a fantasy boffer campaign in America. While attending her second ever event, this character had a similar experience to that first vampire player. She found herself confined to a small area and ridiculed loudly by a large group of experienced players who then killed her character. However, immediately afterwards, they commended her role-playing skills out of game. She explained, 
even if there were negative consequences for my character and those people didn't like me in play, out of play they made the point of making sure that I still felt welcome. Even though the campaign did not feature formal debriefing, the players diffused any brewing issues through positive reinforcement and communication. I believe that we need to raise awareness of the phenomenon of bleed and accept that these experiences often constitute the most special moments of role playing. Bleed exists across genre, across form. No one style of game, be it LARP, tabletop, or virtual, has the monopoly on bleed, nor does any genre own it. We should develop a language around bleed, encouraging active, mature discussion within our communities. We should establish methods to increase the emotional safety of our games through workshops, signaling systems, and debriefing. I believe that accepting and understanding bleed is one of the key steps that will help us mature as a subculture and allow us to push the envelope even further in our attempts to un explore the unknown with one another. Thank you. <laughs>